Our second scripture reading today comes to us from the book of Exodus. Last week we heard about Jacob, and uh, now we are in Egypt because that's where Jacob and his descendants ended up. Let us hear now from Exodus. Now a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, the Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put foremen of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread. So much so that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made, the, made their lives miserable with hard labor by making mortar and bricks, doing field work, and forcing them to do all kinds of other cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Shifra and Pua. When you are helping the women to give birth and you see a baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called in the two midwives and said to them, why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? And the two midwives said to Pharaoh, because Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, they're much stronger, and they give birth before any midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well and kept on multiplying and making them strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. And then Pharaoh gave an order to all of his people, throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews alive into the Nile River, but all the girls you can let live. Now a man from Levi's household married a Levite woman the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, and so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and sealed it up with black tar, and she put the child in the basket and set the basket among the reeds at the riverbank. The baby's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to the bathe at the river, and while her women servants were walking alongside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds, and she said to one of her servants to bring it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. The boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then the baby's sister came to Pharaoh's daughter and said, would you like me to go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter agreed, yes, do that. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I'll pay you for your work. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And after the child had grown up, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I pulled him out of the water. A number of years later, our story continues. Moses was taking care for the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert, and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in fire in the middle of a bush, Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. And then Moses said to himself, let me check out this amazing sight and find out why this bush isn't burning up. When the Lord saw that he was coming to look, God called out from the bush and said, Moses, Moses. 
Moses said, I am here. Then the Lord said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. He continued, I am the God of Abraham, your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I have heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that's full of milk and honey a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? to go to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I now come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me, they're going to ask, what's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent you, has sent me to you. God continued, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, Jacob's God has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how all generations will remember me. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. God. Isaac attended his first Montreat conference almost exactly 10 years ago. The conference planning team was ready to provide childcare, but since he was the only one signed up, I really didn't know how much I was going to use it anyway, and so I told them not to worry about it. He was an easy baby. I was used to having him with me all the time. It would be a breeze. (laughs) Fast forward to the conference, he was still a very joyful and easy baby. He also just happened to find his voice, and he had a lot to say. I sat in the back of rooms, trying both to interact with him and also to keep him quiet. As a preacher, I always make sure to emphasize to caregivers not to worry about the sounds that their kids are making. But as a parent, that's all you can hear. (laughs) This joyful baby babbling, I was keenly aware, was competing with the workshop leaders and speakers. And I just couldn't keep him quiet. He was exactly three months old. Ever since that experience, I can't read about this story of baby Moses the same way. I'm sure that Moses recognized, uh, Moses' mother recognized his developmental leap. She knew that no longer could she keep her sweet baby boy quiet enough to hide him. Often these Bible stories take on a mythic and epic proportion, but a three-month-old baby finding his voice, that feels very real. Did you ever wonder what Moses' mother named him? Maybe Asher, because he was so happy. Or maybe Isaac, because he was a laughing bundle of joy. Or maybe David, beloved. Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses because he was pulled out of the water, but she didn't give him that name until he was brought back to the palace as a young boy, after having been fully weaned which means that in Moses' earliest memories of self, he was called by a different name. 
If we recognize distinct phases of Moses' life, the first segment would be his birth and early years at home with his mother and family, and then next his later childhood years on into adulthood where he lived in the palace and he enjoyed all the privileges of Egyptian royalty. Our reading picks up with Midian Moses. I always imagine Midian Moses to be an old man at this point, but we don't know exactly how old he was. However, he was diminished. In his youth, he had a sense that he was being called to be a great leader and liberator, but when he took matters into his own hands, it didn't go so well. So Midian Moses is just living a pretty ordinary life until he hears God's voice from a burning bush. Soon he will become liberator Moses, the one who speaks from God and brings God's people out of slavery, the one through whom God gives the Torah, but not yet. This burning bush scene is the hinge point between who he had been and who God was calling him to be. So it's no wonder that when Moses responds to God's call, it's with the question, who am I? Who am I to do this? He had already tried to be the hero, and that hadn't worked out very well. And since then, he hadn't gotten any younger or stronger or more influential. The conversation continues beyond our reading, with Moses continuing to reiterate, God, I just can't do it. We know how that conversation eventually ends. When was the last time you felt like you were up against the impossible? Maybe you even said, God, I just can't do this. Sometimes we can look back on those stories in our lives and be encouraged from the memory and the knowledge that we made it through, even if things ended differently than we'd hoped. There's a popular mantra, we can do hard things. More often my thought is, thank God that's behind me. We love stories of people who have overcome all kinds of odds to succeed. And Hollywood loves to tell these stories with a little embellishment. We have the long shot athletes or the small town sports teams who go the distance, or the students at inner city schools who rise above their hard life circumstances to find success. We read about those who have made it through horrific natural or humanitarian disasters. We love these stories because they remind us of the indomitable human spirit. Those are especially inspiring stories because they're outliers. That's not most of us. It's not even Moses. All of us have limits to what we can do, and sometimes we fail to reach our goals. Sometimes we just fail spectacularly. And sometimes the most reasonable response to an impossible task is, I think you have the wrong person. Or to put it another way, who am I? God doesn't give Moses the pep talk of, you can do hard things. Moses is still alive against all odds, but not because of anything that he did. Moses is alive because of two strong and courageous midwives, Shifra and Pua. He's alive because of the defiance and dedication of his mother, not to mention her basket weaving skills. He's alive because of his sister Miriam, who watched and waited, who was bold enough to approach Pharaoh's daughter with a plan. And he's alive because of Pharaoh's daughter, the unexpected Egyptian hero who defied her father's orders. He's alive because of Jethro, his father-in-law, who took him in when he was on the run. Moses had tried to liberate his own way, but quickly realized he wasn't up for the task. So who is he to be a liberator now? He was the one birthed into this life by faithful conspirators. 
He was the child and the ward of courageous guardians, the asylum seeker who found refuge in Midian. Moses' identity was indelibly shaped by the faithful people who did hard things. All week as I've been working on this, I've had an earworm, a song from Sweet Honey and the Rock that was a favorite of the women's a cappella group at my alma mater. Who are we? In Isai Maria Barnwell's words, we are our grandmother's prayers. We are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of the ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are shaped by the ones who have come before us. And we are shaped by the ones who come alongside us. The late Archbishop Desmond Tutu introduced many of us to the Nguni Bantu proverb or concept of Ubuntu. Sometimes it's translated as community. It really means I am because we are. We are one. We are interconnected, responsible to and supported by the community around us. Ubuntu is deeply connected to the work of peacemaking. On this Peace and Global Witness Sunday, which always coincides with World Communion Sunday, we are especially reminded of our connection with one another. We engage in peacemaking because we recognize that our peace is inseparable from the peace of others. And God knows that too many people in too many places are in deep need of peace. Peace also cannot be separated from the work of justice. If we seek peace without pursuing justice, the best we can achieve is the temporary cessation of conflict. Moses and Aaron together initially asked Pharaoh to let my people go for a few days. They would journey into the wilderness and hold a religious festival and return. It's a pretty peaceful request. It's not unreasonable, but injustice is not reasonable. It cannot be reasoned with. It has to be dismantled in order to make way for the foundation of peace. That's hard work. It often feels impossible. Peacemaking, justice work. Who am I to enter the fray? Who are we to claim the mantle of peacemakers? We are our grandmother's prayers. We are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of the ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are indebted to our ancestors, and we recognize that all of humanity is inextricably bound together that I am because we are, and we don't do this work alone. Like I said, if we were to keep reading Moses' story, we would hear Moses protest again and again, God, I can't do this. I don't have what it takes. I'm not up to the task. And so God brings Aaron alongside of him. We're not called to do this work alone, not one of us. There are some struggles that only we ourselves can go through, but struggles, internal and external, still were not meant to be done alone. The work is daunting, and whether we're looking at the many needs around the globe or the pamphlets filled with hate and racism and homophobia that have been strategically scattered around town, or the school boards debating the created goodness of God's children. It's daunting. And maybe we can't even get that far because we're so wrapped up in our battles at home or at work or at school or in the neural pathways of our brains. Who is any of us to go up against such forces? We can because we are because we don't do this alone. God calls us into the work of peacemaking and justice as a community, and just as God promised Moses that God would be with him, God is with us too. 
God tells Moses, I will be with you. And Moses' question turns from who am I to who are you? I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who I am or who we are because God is and God will be. God is already in the places where God calls us. God is already in the daunting and the mundane. Where can we flee from God's presence? It's a poetic and rhetorical question. There's no place, there's no task, there's nothing to which we can be called that is beyond the presence and power of God. Who am I to do this hard thing? On our own, we're sunk. But because God has been faithful to all generations, we have been shaped by those who came before us. Because we have been created in and formed by community, we are in this together. And because God is, and because God will be, we are not, and we never will be alone. Thanks be to God.